This place commemorates the communities which were wiped out in the Holocaust. And at the bottom, the Shtetl Salotvin, where I come from, it is no more. It was poor, it was orthodox, and it was Jewish. They were very poor. We didn't have things that other people had. They had shoes, and they had food, and we didn't. And at the end of the war, I discovered the fate of my parents and my sisters and brothers, relatives and neighbors. I don't know what went through their mind as they realized that they've been tricked into a gas chamber, many of them. But one thing they hoped is that they will not be forgotten. And this memorial in Jerusalem <laughs> proves it. Lonely, burdened by debts, and facing exposure as a fraudulent bankrupt, Robert Maxwell retreated during his last days into memories of his childhood and origins. Three years earlier, it was so different. Maxwell invited a thousand admirers to his Oxford mansion to celebrate his 65th birthday party. Politicians and bankers hailed the tycoon. 20 years earlier, Maxwell had been condemned by government inspectors as a fraudster, but now he had re-established himself, trusted by the world's bankers. He is the boss of the Credit Lyonnais. Michael Richardson was among the city's bankers and brokers whose disregard of the past endorsed Maxwell's claim to honesty. The testimonials were vital to restore his credibility. I would like to ask a very long-standing friend of my father's <laughs> to come and speak on behalf of the guest, Michael Richardson. Bertie and Bob, this must be the party of the decade. All of us are very proud to be here because I believe you've made a major contribution to all our lives. So on behalf of all your guests, thank you both very much indeed. I'm, of course, very notorious about many things, but very few people really appreciate that everything that I have done with the help of thousands of people has only been made possible because of Pergamon Press. Pergamon was Maxwell's brainchild. Despite his lack of education, he'd earned millions by creating one of the world's leading scientific publishers. He'd used his money to buy publicity, win a Labour seat in the House of Commons, and provide luxury for his nine children. We both teach them that having money isn't just everything. The privilege uh, of money also imposes duties and uh, limitations. By 1969, Maxwell's uncontrolled ambition was shuddering towards catastrophe. His bid for the news of the world was defeated by Rupert Murdoch. Mr. Maxwell called me a moth-eaten kangaroo. Well, I've uh, <laughs> never got quite to that stage. Employees began to understand the Maxwell style of business. I said, Mr. Maxwell, you're the sincerest liar I've ever met. And his reaction was to laugh, because I generally th think he took that as one of the nicest compliments I could have paid him. During his sale of Pergamon, his financial accounts were found to be fraudulent, and he was condemned by government inspectors as unfit to manage a publicly owned company. Cast into the wilderness, Maxwell had lost most of his fortune and was condemned as a crook. For all practical purposes, I should have been dead and gone then. It feels awful. I lost five years of my life 
but uh, to me, I dusted myself down and got up and got on with the job. But I never give up. By 1984, Maxwell had bounced back. He'd earned millions after buying Britain's biggest printing company. Then he bought the Daily Mirror. Maxwell became a multimillionaire overnight. Hailed as a saviour, he sought his revenge against Rupert Murdoch. I am committed to getting the mirror on top of the sun. I have set myself a target of two years to achieve the goal. What do you think of this meeting? It's excellent. Good, it hasn't started yet. You wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly have a major say in the political line of the paper. I certainly have a major say on the editorials. Unleashing a wave of vanity appearances, Maxwell suffocated most doubts about his credibility. There are instant prizes to be won. I'm waiting to make one of you a millionaire. I don't honestly think that you would find from anyone around at that time in Mirror Group, at whatever level, uh, would say, this man's going to do something dreadful. He's a crook, and crooks never reform. I keep on repeating, I'll say it for the last time, I'm not on some ego trip. In 1987, Maxwell renamed his empire the Maxwell Communications Corporation. Robert Maxwell is a multifaceted individual, businessman, politician, family man, publisher, and a man who speaks nine languages. He is an international figure, an intimate confidant of heads of state. Maxwell personally dictated his own publicity. Why don't you quote Goldman Sachs that says if only all other British businessmen were like Mr. Robert Maxwell, that's the best quote that you can get. The other thing that you cannot say about me, this is Mr. Maxwell's a many-sided man. You've got to deal with the issues of what else I am. It's in politics. Unquestioning executives helped to mould the Maxwell image. The many-sided Maxwell, where has he got to? It's about up, sir. To satisfy his obsession to overtake Murdoch, Maxwell sought opportunities to exaggerate his wealth. Look at Mr. Murdoch's achievements and look at mine. Both of us are candidates for one of the top positions as a media company of the world, one of the ten slots. He's doing very well. I'm not doing too badly. The difference between him and me is that he owes the banks six billion dollars. And until I get Macmillan, the banks owe me one billion dollars. People prefer the Maxwell position to that of Murdoch. In 1988, Maxwell fed his ambitions to join the Big Ten Club. He bought the official airline's guide and then the American publishing giant, Macmillan. Over three billion pounds of his money was borrowed from banks. I was one of two non-executive directors at that time. As far as I know, no bank uh, or any other body ever approached us with a single question about the basis on which they were uh, going to lend the money or anything to do with it. And was it a lot of money? Oh, yes. It was about three billion. But it was without security. And I must say, I was pretty amazed at that. Maxwell was convinced that by juggling his accounts, he could repay the loans. Reality was concealed. Despite the recession, rising interest rates and falling profits, Maxwell boasted that he was earning increased profits. The stage was set for his final major fraud. It's a human error. It's on my foot. At the heart of his empire, Maxwell trusted just two people. In business, he trusted only Kevin, his 30-year-old son. Estranged from his wife, Maxwell relied emotionally upon Andrea Martin, his personal assistant. Well, on some occasions, she would just arrive and kick off her shoes and throw herself on one of the chairs or settee, and RM would say, let's have, let's have champagne, never-ending champagne, Douglas, and, uh, and smoke salmon or caviar, whatever took his fancy. And th that was my instructions, and that's what I had to serve. That's something else. Yes, we do need to do. Do you want to get him on the phone? Very close, Sorry. friend. Yes. Well, it showed by 
by their attitude towards one another. I smelt it, the endearments. I would say he was besotted by her. However, from Andrea Martin's point of view, the relationship with Robert Maxwell was purely professional. Yes, I have. Well, he had a phobia about grey hair, you see. Even an eyebrow, if he saw a grey eyebrow, uh, he would he would go, go, go berserk. You know. Berserk? <laughs> what does that mean, he went berserk? Well, well he'd call me and come immediately and die over the grey hair. He could have done it himself. You know. The image was an immensely rich, powerful tycoon, owner of one of the world's largest yachts. The reality was a man unable to repay his debts. The empire was tottering on the verge of bankruptcy. Maxwell's concentration was faltering as he pursued dozens of unprofitable ventures. The truth was concealed by compliant, unquestioning executives whose loyalty and silence was bought by huge salaries. I think what made Rob Maxwell happy was his power over people, be it man or woman. Sure. I would see him how he bullied top executives. Well, you've agreed the heads of agreement, so now it's converting. No, you better draft. show them to me again. I must see it again. You Nothing will see it again. Help them. No, you're going to see it again. It. Right. You better get him on the phone and tell him yeah. so, not to try. It's something quite different. Get him on the phone. I was always regarded as Robert Maxwell's spokesman. But there was no opportunity to go beyond the song sheet that you were given. One of his constant phrases to the minions was, who pays your wages, mister? So you were scared of him? I was very respectful of my salary. <laughs> I know Jesus, now that's unwelcome visitor. Fuck off. Verbally violent. There were occasions when I was on the receiving end of that, and uh, I think you, you just took the, uh, took, the, took, the, took the view that, well, OK, it was my turn this morning. It was, it was, I'm trusting this afternoon. Let's hope it's somebody else's turn. Go into the survival plan document, which gives all the information on the history of it. The BPC to survival plan. Yes. Right. It's got to go that's immediately. Yes, that's been done. Done this morning, haven't discovered yet. Well, no. Why not? Um, helicopter will be Ian, RM, Andrea. And what does that say? Moscow. Yes, that's, that's quite right. Awesome. That's just St. Transit, Mo Moscow, Tokyo. Crisscrossing the world in his Gulfstream jet, Maxwell styled himself as an emperor, spending money he could not afford. Call me back right away. I'm in, in uh, the plane. Wherever Robert Maxwell travelled, I would have a, a fridge put in his suite, not a normal fridge, but a full-size fridge. And in that fridge, there would be everything that he wanted. It was always placed ahead of him before he got there. Douglas? He would just say, I want smoked salmon. I want caviar. I want champagne. And it was provided for him. No project brought Maxwell more publicity than his ventures in communist Europe and Russia. His association with Mikhail Gorbachev was based on relationships forged 45 years earlier with the KGB. Robert Maxwell, who I know, and I do welcome this idea, uh, which has also now involved Mr. Maxwell, uh, someone I know very well for a long time. Maxwell boasted a close relationship with the KGB, as confirmed by its former chief. Uh, Maxwell was a special person. He was uh, uh, received in our highest, highest spheres. Maxwell's links with British intelligence were equally close. At MI6's headquarters in 1949, it was decided to finance his publishing venture as a cover to recruit Soviet scientists. Well, Maxwell would be recruiting people, uh, interrogating people, what their scientific views were or weren't. Or, and basically, I think, in those days, um, probably trying to get 
odd scientists, as it were, on our side. Maxwell had been spotted by MI6 as an officer in post-war Berlin. It was obvious that he'd been doing odd things for MI6, probably in Germany already, and he suggested that um, we should subsidise him to buy a bookshop. This is Maxwell? Book business, yes. So you picked him, and Maxwell was to be your agent? Yes, basically, yeah. And you were subsidising him? Well, we subsidised him in the, in the form of... Uh, helping him buy his business. Was it unusual for MI6 to do that with businessmen? I don't know of any other case. Um, I was certainly never involved in any other case of MI6 buying a business for anybody. Maxwell had first visited Moscow in 1954, the height of the Cold War. Winning unprecedented access, he gained an extraordinary deal, publishing the books of top Soviet scientists. His success was blessed by the KGB. He was evidently special. There was no other man on such scale as Maxwell. I know very well that these, these kind of continuing uh, relations were not possible without uh, direction of Central Committee and having no objections from KGB. Mm. Maxwell's activities as a KGB agent of influence was tested in 1968, on the eve of the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, when Maxwell was a Labour Member of Parliament, he was approached by Zalavon Litvin, a Soviet intelligence officer, and then escorted to the chief of the KGB. Maxwell agreed to argue in Parliament that Britain should tolerate the invasion. In our parlance, it was called a uh, useful official relation. So that meant that a foreigner, in this case a foreigner, can be useful to us as a person who would have an access to some information and who would willingly or unwillingly share it with us. We wouldn't have thought that he would be picked up by the KGB at that stage, I don't know, I don't think so. Most unlikely. Mixing with the famous bestowed upon Maxwell the image of respectability and wealth, but concealed reality. Maxwell's finances were in ruins. Unknown to outsiders, by 1990, Maxwell had simply run out of cash. Keeping the price of shares in Maxwell Communications high was vital to guarantee his loans. He was secretly spending millions buying his own shares. Even his own directors were deluded. I had no way of telling that he was under special strain or that he was close to collapse. He, he didn't appear so. Come in? Yep. Where are you? All right, so what are we going? Come on, what are we going? You heard me. Maxwell concealed his financial problems by secretly using other people's shares. Those shares were deposited with Maxwell's own recently established investment bank. As the pressure to repay his vast debts intensified, he and Kevin used those shares to raise loans. <coughs> Will you please keep him off me? Right. I don't want him. Just ask Goldsmith to come see me. Yeah. OK? Yeah, immediately. <clears throat> yeah. And when will you be back? I'll be back straight after that lunch. This is for private purposes. Not Desperate good. for more money to repay his debts, Maxwell's targets were the pension funds of his companies. Their investments were managed by BIM under Maxwell's control. His assurances appeared sincere. As chairman of the Maxwell Group of Companies Pension Funds, I'm addressing you today for the purpose of persuading you that it is in your and your family's best interest to remain a member of whichever pension scheme you are a member of in our group. The pension fund manager at BIM was Trevor Cook. He had effectively convinced them that he was a safe pair of hands. Well, why don't you say that your increased profits have gone up? Well, I can do that. It's actually my 220. <laughs> what? 220. 
2.2 million. Well, that's... No, to, 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 to 2.1 million. Maxwell directed where the funds, hundreds of millions of pounds, should be invested. In terms of investment uh, prowess, he was very keen to demonstrate how good he was. Maxwell directed that the pension funds should allow his private companies to lend the funds shares to the big city institutions in return for a fee. It all appeared legitimate. But secretly, Maxwell didn't lend the shares. Instead, he used them to borrow money for himself. Kevin simply phoned up uh, one day and asked if I could pass some share certificates, which I held in the pensions office safe, over to him. The majority of the share certificates of BIM were held by Kevin Maxwell in his safe. It meant that Kevin was able to use the pension fund assets effectively for the purposes for which they were not intended. In his successful defence, Kevin described how, operating in the one-group culture created by his father, he believed their use of pension funds was legitimate. To get on the phone. Okay. Right. Among the pension fund shares plundered by Robert Maxwell were these certificates for 25 million shares. Clearly owned by the Mirror Pension Fund, they were sold on Maxwell's instructions by bankers Goldman Sachs. But the proceeds were not handed over to the pension fund. The money was paid by the bankers to Maxwell. It's difficult to believe that they weren't aware the bankers, because there were share certificates which had the pension scheme's name on them. The pension schemes lost £55 million. At the very time that the secret diversion of pension fund shares was underway, Maxwell arrived at Hastings College, Nebraska, to receive an honorary degree and to lecture graduates about his virtues and principles. I hope you will be interested in my comments about how my mother's ideas were instilled in me. She told a relative many years ago, my son will be famous someday. I just feel it, and I know it. My mother's confidence, her total belief in me was so real that it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. She made me feel important, and she taught me the one thing that I have never forgotten the difference between good and evil. And I hope I'll be forgiven if I tell you the other things that she taught me, that confidence like virginity could only be lost once. To raise more money as his finances worsened, six months before his death, Maxwell sold 49% of the Mirror Group. In a huge publicity drive, he tried to persuade investors it was worth 500 million pounds. In the event, he received less than half. The blame was placed on the Max Factor, the inherent distrust of his finances. His past had caught up with him as he was asked to explain why anyone should trust a businessman condemned by government inspectors 20 years earlier. My record since then, as chairman of many public companies, I hope will satisfy even uh, you, sir. Next question. No, you cannot. Next question. In preparing the sale, Maxwell perpetrated a major deception. To prevent Cooper's discovery of the theft of pension fund shares, he persuaded the accountants to extend the pension fund's financial year. So again, the accountants did not see the share certificates. <laughs> Since all the high-paid professionals agreed to Maxwell's request, Ernest Barrington, the managing director, did not complain. Well, he didn't ask me about it, he just did it. But you were the man managing director? Yes. You were in charge of Mirror Group? Yes, but he, he, uh, this man would do things, and this was part of the trouble to come. He would do things without telling other people. You mean he changed the financial year and didn't even consult you? Well, he didn't consult me, there's no question about it. And did he tell you about it? No, I, I found out about it, I forget when, sometime later. Just give him the message, please, and stop giving us a hard time. Weren't you worried by that? Well, I have to admit, I didn't see any particular danger in that. It was irregular, but um, 
I didn't really see it as a danger sign. One name has become synonymous with this fast-paced industry. One man and the company he founded has done more than any other to harness the communications revolution. The man is Robert Maxwell. The company is Maxwell Communication Corporation. Maxwell's carefully cultivated image concealed his next target. He secretly took over 300 million pounds from MCC itself to buy his own shares. The eventual discovery prompted a boardroom row. Both Maxwells promised that repayment from their private fortune would be easy. Bob, in fact, gave us a number of assurances in writing, uh, provided us with a list uh, during the subsequent investigations, uh, demonstrating the free assets that could be provided uh, as security. In retrospect, I'm sure that, in fact, that wouldn't have stood up either. Bob was lying. There's no question about it. They, in fact... And you believe the lies? Oh, yes, we did. Yes, we had no reason still at that stage. Concern, yes, but lying, that's something different. Peter Jay suggested the 28th and 29th of September for Moscow. But Maxwell couldn't control his personal relationships. Not only was he living apart from his wife, but his employment of Andrea Martin was to end in unfortunate circumstances. She had become... Um, a confidant, someone to bounce ideas off, someone who knew the innermost secrets, the innermost workings of his mind, someone he could express his fears and doubts to. Hi, Nick Davis here. Maxwell blamed the breakdown on Nick Davis, a Daily Mirror journalist who had become Andrea Martin's boyfriend. And he didn't trust Nick Davis. It was like somebody had been given the keys of the back door. And he didn't like that. It was, you know, he didn't mind her having the key to the back door, or the front door, or all the keys. But it was as though, somehow or other, someone had got a key to the back door. Andrea, where's that? He asked me if I could check up through the telephone calls whether or not they were still in touch. And I did, and it proved they were still in touch. It was sufficient for him to realise that she was being, in that sense, disloyal to him. And I think it was no longer a game. It was very, very serious. It affected him. I just got the impression he was a broken man. It's like, what, what else is going to happen? What else can happen to me? <laughs> you know, I mean, who else is there left I can talk to? Suddenly, I think he was, um, he was on his own. Much of it went down in the dumps after... Andrea departed. Um, he would shut himself off in his room. Didn't like being disturbed. Uh, I would say he, he became a very unhappy man. That summer, as the financial pressures increased and his isolation intensified, Maxwell turned to his own origins lamenting the fate of his family and pondering his own escape from death. Towards the end of his life, Maxwell organized a conference on the Holocaust. They all had one obsession, not to allow the killer to kill, the victims a second time to forget this. The pressure was mounting. As the banks pressed harder for repayment of debts, the Maxwells pledged more shares owned by the pension funds, this time in an Israeli company called Tiva. Ignoring his finances and the latest theft of pension fund shares, Maxwell flew to New York and indulged his fantasy as an international tycoon. He bought the Daily News. Overnight, he was an American star. 
he was just delighted with, the, the, you know, that he had this paper, like a big toy, you know, and uh, uh, everything, and as far as he was concerned, was going good. The new owner of the Daily News, Bob Maxwell. Bob! The paper's new owner, British publisher Robert Maxwell, on hand for the big event. He was there to start the big printing presses rolling once again, and he came into the factory to the roar of cheers. Posing as the savior of the news, Maxwell's real problem was to save his empire. One problem was MCC's worsening image. His solution was the appointment of Peter Walker, the politician, as his successor and chairman. Brought to New York, Walker was introduced to Macmillan's tax specialist to prove the empire's profitability. Peter Walker was a very smart guy, and he came to the conclusion that the company was not as profitable as Maxwell had led him to believe. Maxwell was trying to puff the profits. Uh, I believe he saw right through that, and he probably wasn't interested in carrying on. Weeks later, Walker silently resigned without commenting publicly on his discoveries. In total, he took 500,000 pounds. His severance agreement was signed by Michael Richardson. Maxwell naturally benefited by Walker's silence. Another person who could have warned of Maxwell's operations was Lord Donoghue. When Lord Donoghue resigned, he took £50,000 in return for keeping quiet. The directors of First Tokyo also decided on silence. We didn't sort of put up a flag and say, here are crooks. Hello. I acted throughout on legal advice. And your lawyers told you to say what? Well, they advised me not to. Uh, answer questions of that sort. To keep it quiet? If you put it like that, yes. Betty Maxwell also kept quiet about the collapse of the marriage. Behind the public image, Maxwell resorted to transitory comforts. He was in the habit of, um, after lunch, sending for a girl who would come to his sitting room and the doors would be locked from the inside. It suggested to me and others um, that were close to RM that it was just a, I don't know, a fantasy relationship with these young girls. And afterwards? I understood that presents were given to the girls, yes. What sort of presents? Jewellery. These are sort of thank you presents? Thank you presents, yes. Where are we on... Uh... In August 1991, Ernest Barrington, the Daily Mirror's managing director, was told that £38 million was missing from the company. Puzzled, he asked Maxwell for an explanation. You have nothing to worry about. I don't want you worrying. You have nothing to worry about. Everything is OK. He said the money you are worried about at the moment is invested in guilt for the benefit of the company, and we'll come back. Your concerns are quite unfounded. What did you think about that? <laughs> there, wasn't, there wasn't much one could say, really. What well, did you believe him? I wanted to believe him. Oh, now we can see, yes, we were fobbed off. Worried by his director's questioning, Maxwell feared that they would reveal the truth. Unsure whether the high salaries had bought their loyalty and silence, he summoned his security chief. He would say, can I listen in to this particular conversation? The answer was always yes, of course I can. But he asked me if we could tap the phone, Indeed. which we did, which we did. But those taps pr pr proved nothing. To silence the bank's demands for repayment of debts, Maxwell and Kevin sold more pension fund shares. The shares in Cytex, an Israeli high-tech company, were owned partly by Maxwell and partly by the pension funds. But when Maxwell sold the shares, he claimed to own them all and pocketed £139 million. 
The problem is, of course, he was actually taking the money and using it for somebody else's benefit. But why didn't you find that out? Um, well, it's too simple to say he didn't tell us. Um, but he had the systems in place which ensured that, really, it was not easy to find out. But why didn't you challenge those systems? Well, we didn't know there was anything wrong with them. He was simply so convincing and you so reassured that you know, the money was being transferred across. He fooled me, taught me. They led us to believe completely, in fact, that the issue had been one, as they said, of a temporary uh, uh, problem which had been properly corrected. And you believe them? Yes, we did. He had you fooled? Absolutely. Yes. Again, in my view, they were both consummate actors. The four. Look at that. Everything was going on the fire. I didn't know that. I never imagined that in my wildest thinking that that was happening. All that pension money, as well as company money, not just this company, but that company and the other company, hundreds of companies, the mind boggles. Now, uh, the only people who could possibly have known that he was in that kind of serious money trouble were people in the city of London, I suppose. Bankers everywhere were demanding repayment of their loans. We were running around like headless chickens. It was murder. NatWest Tower, Credit Suisse, Credit Leonay, Goldman Sachs, you name it, anything to do with the bank when we were there. He was always running around in a filthy temper, filthy mood. In October, Maxwell looked for salvation in America. Maxwell launched at the United Nations an American edition of the European, his loss-making newspaper. It appeared to be a vintage Maxwell show, except that he was clearly unwell. Hours later, he consulted a doctor. Uh, you know, he had chest pains, and uh, I understand that uh, he had uh, coronary artery problems, so this might have uh, been a sign of uh, an angina attack. Across the city, Maxwell was perfecting another ruse. 50 million pounds he'd privately borrowed from Bankers Trust was repaid with the bank's agreement by the Daily Mirror. The conduit was the Daily News. I guess, you know, the, the only simple way to put it is we were being used to uh, disguise the nature of the transaction. I guess, you know, the term could, could be used as laundering, but in effect, it was definitely not honest on the part of the Maxwells. You just can't borrow money on a public company and use it to pay a private debt. They were using Mirror Group as their piggy bank. I wouldn't consider myself gullible. I'm a New Yorker. Very cynical. But you believe them? Uh, they, the Maxwells were running billion dollar companies, had been advanced funds by some of the biggest names in world finance. If they felt comfortable dealing with the Maxwells and advancing them hundreds of millions of dollars, I didn't have very much reason to doubt what they were telling me. They were the toast of the world. In the midst of that financial mayhem, Maxwell was accused of helping Mossad, Israel's intelligence service, kidnap Mordechai Venunu from London. Venunu had offered the Mirror the secrets of Israel's nuclear bomb. Will he ask the Prime Minister, as head of the Security and Intelligence Services, to order an immediate inquiry into the alleged relationship between the Israeli intelligence service and Robert Maxwell? He was not an Israeli agent. He didn't work for the Mossad. How do you know? Uh, that, that I can tell you for sure. How do you know he didn't work for Mossad? I can tell you for sure. <laughs> he was not an agent of the Israeli Mossad. Those accusations, regardless of Israel's denials, isolated Maxwell even further. He was really upset, furious, almost deranged. 
Maxwell returned to London beleaguered and sick. He had the worst case of flu that I've ever, I've ever seen on, on anybody, really. And I've seen some bad cases of flu in my life. Uh, he couldn't breathe, couldn't talk properly, had a sore throat. He had an eye infection. Oh, he just about everything. If it had been a horse, you'd have had it put down. The clock was ticking. Two banks, Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs, owed $500 million, were threatening to sell shares to recover their money. Their sale would expose Maxwell's bankruptcy. Swiss Bank, owed 57 million pounds, was threatening to summon the fraud squad. Over one billion pounds had been stolen. Maxwell's empire was sinking. Salvation was a dream. He was alone in the bedroom and was playing classical music. The volume was unbelievable. It was a Sunday afternoon, and when you looked at the people around him, in the flat, they were all hired help, every single one. It's amazing. There wasn't one member of the family. You know, everyone there was paid for. And I think that that, in some way, sort of sums it up, that in the end, even when he was ill, there wasn't anybody there to say, Dad's ill, let's go and look after him, or whatever it was, because he'd driven the wedge. It was complete. He must have been terribly worried because there was an unusual telephone call from him, a subdued tone of voice. And, uh, why are people trying to destroy me? Tell me why. He thought there was a conspiracy to destroy him. During the night of 29th October, Maxwell decided to fly to his yacht, anchored in Gibraltar. He put his arms around me and generally embraced me and said, thanks for everything. He said, you know, Mr. Wheeler, you're my oldest friend. I said, Mr. Maxwell, you mean I'm your only friend? He said, I think you're right. <laughs> at 6 a.m., he flew from the rooftop in Hoban to his Gulf Stream at Luton Airport. He seemed in a fairly good mood. He said he was going down to get some warm air because he had a cold. Three hours later, he boarded his yacht. Very pleasant, good man. He was still trying to get rid of this cold that he couldn't shake off. At the captain's suggestion, they sailed to Madeira, a two day voyage filmed by a crewman. He was reading papers, watching movies, generally trying to relax and enjoy himself. On the captain's recommendation, Maxwell agreed to head for the Canary Islands. We left uh, in time to get to Tenerife the following morning. He'll be here in one minute. During that journey, the Gulf Stream pilot asked for permission to fly low over the Lady Ghislaine. It came to our mind that it would be a good occasion to do some low-level flying, which we knew Mr Maxwell liked. On their arrival in the Canaries, Maxwell ordered the captain to look for calm sea. He wanted to do some swimming that afternoon. After his swim, everyone believed that Maxwell was returning to London. He was in a fairly good mood. He'd enjoyed his time on the yacht. Uh, his cold appeared to be getting better, he said, and uh, he was expecting us to fly back to England the following day. A brief call to London had confirmed that the financial position remained dire. All three banks had carried out their threats. Two had sold shares and one had summoned the police. Maxwell told Ian that he was still too ill to return to speak at an Anglo-Israeli dinner. Of all nights that my father would have wished to have been present, this, I think, would be it. At that moment, 
Robert Maxwell was driving towards Tenerife's best hotel. He gave no impression of being concerned by his plight. He went ashore that night for dinner. He had a good meal. Came back to the boat, jovial mood. He slept much better at night when the boat was at sea. That night, on a course plotted by Rankin, the yacht circumnavigated the islands. Before midnight, Maxwell gave his last instruction. I don't want to receive any more phone calls. I'm going to sleep. This was not an unusual request. I was on watch until 12 midnight. And at that point, as far as I knew, it was an uneventful night. I went to sleep. Four hours later, with no other boat on the radar, Maxwell emerged on the deck. He met the engineer. His cabin, he complained, was too hot. The air conditioning should be adjusted. 30 minutes later, Maxwell phoned the bridge to complain again. He mentioned the cabin temperature. Could he adjust it? And that was the last call the crew received from him. During the next two hours, before the crew began their daily chores, Robert Maxwell went overboard into the sea. At 11 o'clock that morning, anchored off southern Tenerife, Rankin connected a telephone call from New York to Maxwell's cabin. When he received no reply, Rankin's reaction was... Surprise. The reaction now is, where is he? So we went up and looked in all the usual places and couldn't find him. It required my key to unlock the door, and then it opened, expecting him to be in the bed or something, and nobody was there. And at some point, it sinks in that this person is not on the boat. This is Mr. Ian Maxwell and Mr. Kevin Maxwell. Evening. Remarkably composed, I thought. It was almost as though they were prepared for it. It's very sad news for me and my brother, for my mother. At the end of the day, Maxwell's body was found and identified by his widow and eldest son. At daybreak, he was transferred for an autopsy. Four hours later, the pathologist announced his verdict. During the autopsy, we found considerable obstruction of the two coronary arteries. We concluded that the probable cause of death was a heart attack. By the time the body was flown to Israel for burial, Lamella's verdict was already disputed. Maxwell's death had become a mystery, open to speculation. I think that it could have been that he was murdered. The last thing that was saw that uh, he committed suicide. A second autopsy was performed on the dissected and embalmed body by Dr. Ian West. There's no sign, for instance, of the usual pattern of injuries that one sees in a person who has been assaulted. So you concluded? The murder was very unlikely. The Spaniards' finding against drowning because no water was found in Maxwell's lungs was contradicted by West. In the lungs, there was a lot of froth, which both the Israeli pathologists and myself noted. And that was consistent with drowning. I think that probably death is due to drowning. I can't prove it. Considering Maxwell's imminent bankruptcy, West speculated that Maxwell had committed suicide. You've got to look for a motive why this man may have decided to kill himself. There is not sufficient evidence to prove, beyond all reasonable doubt, that he killed himself. So a suicide verdict could not be brought. The known facts are that in the weeks before his death, Maxwell was certainly unwell. He had quite severe lung disease, and this had produced a strain on the heart. He also had some coronary artery disease and an enlarged heart. He could have dropped dead on the deck. Maxwell's illness adds to the probability that the likely cause of death was an accident. Feeling unwell, he had returned to the deck and moved towards the rail. We know from the damage on his muscles that he's been hanging on to something for a while. The painfully torn muscles show that Maxwell slipped before falling into the sea got one of the handrails in his left hand, and he slips. Hangs there for a second, can't hold his weight, and then goes into the water. But he obviously did topple over the rail. Anybody could topple over the rail. It wasn't impossible at all. 
anybody could have toppled over accidentally off of that boat on the aft end. After hearing the news of his father's death, Kevin's performance barely faltered. Hour after hour, he met dozens of threatening bankers demanding repayment of loans. Kevin knew the truth. He had perfected a virtuoso performance. Again, there's been a lot of speculation about uh, crisis meetings with bankers. And I'd like to, uh, for the record, categorically assure uh, our employees the bank uh, arrangements for both public companies are robust. I think he lied because he wanted to buy time. Uh, and he hoped to be able to take some actions which could correct the situation. I don't think that anyone would ever describe me as being a member of the Salvation Army. Again, there's not a fibre of me that's a, that's a quitter. I'm in business to make money. As his options narrowed, Kevin flew to New York. He was seeking to organise his private finances and explore the possibility of resurrecting a lifeline based on the Daily News. Coolly, he avoided the truth. What do you say about reports that some of the uh, funds from the Mirror Pension went missing after your father's uh, death? No comments on that. Can you tell us whether you signed any of the cheques that transferred any of the pension money? I have no comments. I'm here on Daily News Business. Thanks very much. Back in London, MCC's directors discovered further unauthorised transfers of the company's shares, previously denied by Kevin. Kevin and Ian had both signed, at some stage, transfer certificates. So when Kevin had said that he knew nothing about it, uh, that certainly was a lie. Daily, the investigations in London unravelled more evidence of the frauds. Having abandoned his New York survival plan, Kevin could only wait as the noose tightened. Mm -hmm. Piss uh, off, we don't get up for an hour. Oh. I am about to call the police. Morning, we are the police. Thank you. In June 1992, Kevin was arrested. It would be another three years before his trial. Morning, Kevin. Morning. Big in life, Maxwell's enduring legacy was to author Britain's biggest fraud. <laughs>